All right, well, welcome to the Windows Internal Workshop. I'm Sam Bown, and there are three other people here to help you, uh, Elizabeth, Irvin, and Caitlin, who are in the uh, Discord anyway, and they're probably also on the Twitch. And so uh, this is, like all my workshops, it's a capture the flag competition, but it is not a serious one where the challenges are new and uh, nobody's seen them before and you win a big prize by winning. These challenges are from my courses and textbooks and stuff, and uh, but there it's just a fun way to learn. Is the only reason I do it, and the little bit of competition here just makes people motivated to do it. So, go to samsclass.info, and you'll find the link here for Windows Internals. And when you click on that, you are presented with a bunch of challenges and a place where you can submit flags and get on the scoreboard. And I'm going to record everything I do here in little videos and put them on the left so anybody that wants to review something that went by or who shows up late can look at them there. So the first thing, for example, and those of you that got the email and prepared in advance might have a Flare VM. If you don't have a Flare VM, don't panic. But the, let me talk about that. The Flare VM is this thing, which you can get now if you have broadband and you can fast enough to download like 26 gigabytes without it taking forever. Um, but this Flare VM is a virtual Windows 10 machine with a whole bunch of tools installed. And in fact, it's less exciting than I hoped it would be because um, it's very much like Kali. I don't know if you've used Kali Linux, the penetration testing VM. I used it for years and I finally got fed up with it because they keep changing everything. So all my projects keep breaking and um, I got frustrated. And the same thing happened to me here. Most of the tools I'm using are no longer included in the Flare VM because they changed it from like three months ago. So you end up having to download them and install them anyway on Windows. So you could really use any Windows machine to do most of this workshop. You're going to have to download and install tools anyway. And the only thing I'd warn you is don't use your native Windows machine that you have your things you love on it, like your passwords and bank account and browser you usually use and stuff, because we're going to be playing with some stuff. We're not going to play with real malware. We're going to have some files that are intended to mimic malware, but you are going to have to turn off your antivirus for most of these, and you probably don't want to do that on your real machine. So I would prepare a local machine. You can go here and just download a free copy of Windows 2016 and make a local virtual machine, and that's a much smaller download. Or you can put your machine in the cloud. You don't have to download anything. You can use the Azure cloud or the Google cloud, and there's a amount of free service available on either of those clouds, then you can use a cloud machine to do these. So, you know, if you didn't get your Flare VM prepared, don't worry about it. Uh, just get some kind of Windows virtual machine available to you, and uh, that'll be good enough. All right. And I think, let me just talk about the first one here, uh, Process Explorer, to get you started. Oh, well, first let's talk about how to submit a flag. So if you get one of these machines working, you will find a flag in here, like there. After you get this machine installed, there's a window you open, and there's something here covered by a green box. That's the flag. So you note which challenge it is. That's PMA 40.1. And you go up here to the top and submit flags. You find the, uh, the number for your flag, 40.1, and you just put in your name and the flag. And when you do that, you will end up on the scoreboard. And you see, somebody's already done that. So somebody came here with a Flare VM and already put in the points, which is great. So that's all. And they're all like that. They're all, they have different prefixes and they're all out of order because I keep writing these and keep rearranging them for different workshops. All right. And let me just talk about the first one here, which is pretty easy just to get you started. And then I'll pause to upload this video so it's there for other people who may join later. Um, now, so the Process Explorer is here, and I'm using the actual Flare VM, not that it's a big deal, and it's got Process Explorer in it. So um, this one actually has a compiler in it, which is pretty nice. So um, I wrote this where you compile some code, I was, I was, this is something I did not used to know how to do on Windows, but it's very easy. You can, you just have to have Visual Studio, which you can put on any version of Windows, but they've included Visual Studio tools here. Visual Studio 2017, although 2019 is fine and probably so is 2015, 
And then you have to go to open this command prompt. A normal command prompt won't do for some reason. You have to open a command prompt that points to what you want to make. So I want to make x86 native tools, which is 32-bit executables. And they open that command prompt, and it tells you you're ready to make x86 native tools. Now let me make my font bigger, uh, like that and that. Yeah, yeah. OK. All right. And so now I can make Windows software just the way I like to make Linux software, which I was very pleased to learn. So I can go to a directory I've already made called 99. All right. And if I look in here, I made this program called 99.cpp. And I can open it with Notepad. And there it is. And let me make the font bigger. Format, font. All right. This is basically just a Hello World program. It prints a few lines of text. And then it has press enter to continue, which is the only exciting thing here. Because when you run it, it will keep running, waiting for you to press enter, so we can view the running process. That's all. And you can compile Windows code with just this CL command, which is the Windows version of a simple command line compiler like GCC on Linux. So when you do that, you get 99.exe. All right, so now I have that running process. And that's what I wanted, because I can now play with Process Explorer a little. And this is the most famous sysinternals tool, and I wanted to make sure we covered it here. So um, PROCE brings me to Process Explorer. And all these things are free downloads, the Visual Studio Community Edition, and Process Explorer, and all the other tools. So if you just have some other Windows machine, you can install all the tools you need here. And so Process Explorer is here. Process Explorer is extremely useful. And by the way, I don't know if I can make it bigger. Um, options, appearance, options, font. Let's see if I can make it bigger. Um, let's see what that does. OK, good. Better especially for the video. All right, a Process Explorer tells you far more about what's happening on your machine than Microsoft Task Manager, which is the old tool and the one that comes by default with Windows. So what, what it does is it shows you all the processes on your machine pretty much in the order in which they launch. So if you look up here, there's a bunch of stuff in pink. That is all system processes running in the background of the machine. And let me get rid of this lower pane for now. Uh, there we go. All right, all this pink stuff is stuff that the Microsoft Windows system launched before I logged in. Then it ran this process called WinLogon, where I had to log in with a username and password. And after that, I had userland. And this is a big, important concept in Windows. You have user space and kernel space. Kernel space is mostly what runs up here. And those are processes that run with all the privileges to use all the executable instructions on the processor. And user land is like a sandboxed area where you do not have access to many of the instructions. You are expected to, um, so for example, if you want to access the hardware, if you want to print something on the printer from user land, you are not allowed to do it. You're not authorized to do it. All you can do is send an API call to a uh, service that's running in kernel land, and it will print for you. So you're not authorized to directly touch the hardware. You have to go through the Windows API to get to the hardware, which we're going to talk about. So this is all the stuff that launched before you logged in, and it mostly runs as system with full privileges. Then when you log in, this blue stuff is stuff running in user land with your name, with your user account. And um, here's all the various things that have been launched. And down here is 99.exe, the process I just launched. Here's Process Explorer itself. So I can find it here. And now I can learn more about that process by viewing the lower pane, a show lower pane. And you can change what's in the lower pane with view, lower pane view. And you can see dills or handles. And for what we're doing here, we want to see dills. And here we touch one of the really important part of Windows, which we're going to spend a lot of time messing with, um, the library loading. 
Now there is a way to write code called static linking where if you include a library you put a whole copy of the binary library with your executable and package it all together. And that makes the executables large and it means if you run two executables that use the same library you have two copies of the same library in RAM. So this is kind of wasteful of RAM and hard disk space and loading time but it's much more clean and sanitary. Microsoft Windows uses the other technique where if you have a program that uses, say, networking, it'll load a networking library. And if you have another program that uses the same library, it just connects to the image of that networking library in memory that's already there. So two executables share a library. And that is fast and efficient in both space and time, but it is unsanitary because it means that your programs are loading code out from outside the code the developer wrote. And indeed, this very simple program loads all this code here. Uh, the kernel 32 is the user land interface to the kernel routines, and ntdil we'll talk more about later. And here you have a bunch of WoW processes. Those are Windows on Windows processes used because it's 32-bit executable running on a 64-bit version of Windows. And it has to run Windows on Windows, which is sort of like a virtual machine to emulate 32-bit code. And the other thing to see in Process Explorer here is to check the properties where you get to see details of this little program we've written. And one thing that is fun here is to look at the strings. Strings are a very, very good way to get an idea of what's going on with an unknown executable like malware. All you do is you run the strings utility or use one of many graphical utilities that do the same thing. All this does is go through any file, and if it finds any series of printable bytes, it calls that a string. So some of them are actual strings here, like this program cannot be run in DOS mode. Um, some of them are just junk, like GPF and SVW, just a few bytes that happen to be ASCII readable. Here you see uh, the names. This is going to be the PE header. The text, dot text file, dot R data, dot data, and dot reloc. Those are the names of the segments of this file, which we're going to talk a lot about. And if you scroll through this file, you will eventually find the strings that it's going to print out, like 99 bottles of beer. There they are. So the strings you print in your program are just sitting there in memory. Now this is, by the way, the disk image. You have the disk image here and the RAM image there. So the Disk image just has those strings right there in plain readable text. And the memory image is almost an exact copy of exactly what was on the disk for a normal EXE. This is the normal situation. You'll find the same strings here. And this is the way you what you'd expect to see for an ordinary program. Malware authors go to great effort to stop this because they do not want you to be able to read the strings. Um, but for simple programs, the readable text is just right there, both on the disk and in the RAM image when the program is running. So there's a couple of flags in this challenge where you, you get to use Process Explorer a little and see how it goes. And then we'll move on to the other tools and start messing with those DIL libraries. So I'm going to stop this video.